love stories. <coughs> what, what do you consider the, the greatest love stories of all time? Maybe these names come to your mind. Romeo and Juliet. Maybe Elizabeth and Mr. Darcy. How about Rick and Elsa, Casablanca, Emma and Mr. Knightley, Tony and Maria, Wesley and Buttercup, Shrek and Fiona, Maria and Captain Von Trapp. Great love stories. You don't have to be into romance books or like rom-coms to know that a good love story is a good story. We're going to be beginning a four-week study today on one of the great love stories. We find it right here in the Bible. So I encourage you to open up your Bibles to the book of Ruth and follow along. We'll be looking today at Ruth chapter 1. And as we say often, every word of God, and this is the word of God, every word of God proves true. Ruth is a great love story. Tony Merida says this, Ruth is one of the best short stories ever written. Who doesn't love a good story? Once upon a time, they lived happily ever after. Those are phrases that are cherished by many. Ruth possesses all the elements of a well-written story. We're drawn to the characters, grieving Naomi, loyal Ruth, compassionate Boaz. The setting is also intriguing. It takes place during the time of the judges, and the locations include Bethlehem, Moab, Boaz's field, a threshing floor, a city gate, and here, two very unlikely people to get together, an Israelite gentleman and a Moabite widow. She ends up being one of the many times great-grandmothers of Jesus. Great love stories can soften even the most hardened, toughest, roughest person. <laughs> Great love stories work through seemingly impossible odds where love seems out of reach. Great love stories inspire and bring hope that love can be found. And great love stories, unlike other kinds of stories, typically end in happily ever after. Great stories have great characters who are likable in their own right. We want them to succeed. Great, sto great stories have some past obstacles that make love unlikely, and yet they are overcome to unite two unlikely people in love. And they build a love that endures for all time, bringing joy to those around them. Maybe that's your love story. <laughs> You can go ahead and elbow your spouse now. <laughs> Great fictional stories are relatable when they have the setting, when they have characters, when they have emotions, when they have things in them that we can relate to, we can connect with them. Relatable emotional connections. When we know what the obstacles are to actually finding true love. Mm -hmm. How much more when it's not a fictional story but it is a real story with real people in a real time and place. These are real losses. These are real obstacles. The story portrays a real God who brings his love story to us. This love story in Ruth is not only a romance set in a certain place and time, but it precludes and it points to the greatest love story of all. God is love. He first loved us. And though the obstacle of our sin, our separation from him, made it seem impossible, and indeed on our behalf is impossible for us to be united with him, God loved the world so much that he sent his son. God redeemed us to himself in love by Jesus dying for us. And God offers to all people love, and especially to his bride. So while Ruth is a great story, it is a great story, with great characters and settings, it points to a greater truth, that in love, God has redeemed a people for himself through Jesus and brought us to be his own bride. We're gonna take a chapter a week for the next four weeks. This week, chapter one, a bittersweet return. Chapter two, worthy. Chapter three, made for each other. And chapter four, redeemed and united. 
Some of you go to the table of contents first when you read, read books. That's for you. This morning we're going to see, though, in chapter 1, that God preserves us through hard times even if we don't see it. Will you join me in prayer as we begin studying the book of Ruth? Father, we trust your word. It does prove true. And God, we thank you that you are a God who overcomes impossible things for your glory and for our good. We thank you that you have demonstrated your love for us. Would you help us to see in Ruth's story the great good news of Jesus? Would you help us to enjoy your faithfulness to the people in this story? And then would you bring about a change in our hearts that would help us to understand your love, to grow in love for each other and with each other, and to cherish you as our bridegroom, the one who sent his son to redeem us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Well, this story starts off in verse 1. We get a little bit of specific time and place. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. This gives us our setting for the story. Now, all great stories have a good setting. Sometimes they, it seems sparse. Sometimes it seems strange. We have to understand part of the, the setting, the time and the place that this is happening in order to understand that, that what the story is about. When the time, excuse me, when the judges rule, that gives us a specific time in, in history to look, a specific place. Israel and Moab are mentioned here in the book of Israel, or excuse me, in the book of Ruth. The conditions at the time, as we've been talking about in Bible 101, was that the, the people of Israel would, were brought into the promised land. They were told, if you follow me, if you obey my commands, if you love me, I will bless you. I will, I will open up your wombs. I will open up the ground. You will produce much. I will bless your livestock. You will be able to be established in peace. But we see throughout the time of the Judges, and the book of Judges is the book right before Ruth. This is a, a story from that time. We see that the people kind of grew complacent. They kind of decided, well, we've got it pretty good. We're going to go our own way. So they began to fall away from God and fall into idolatry, fall into trying to, to solve things for themselves. And God brought discipline to the people. Sometimes there was no food. Sometimes a, 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 another army, another king would come and try to rule over them, sent by God to, to call them back to himself. And eventually things would get so bad that the people would remember the promises of God. And they would call out to him. And he would raise up a deliverer who would then throw off the yokes of bondage. And God would then again restore his people to the blessing as they turned back to him. And so we see seven cycles here throughout the, the book of Judges. And, and the story of Ruth is in one of those times. We look at the famine, we kind of assume that must have been down on the lower part of this cycle. A place, a time when food was not growing, when it was hard to find something to eat. So what happens in this story is we meet a man who decides that he's going to pursue relief on his own. And isn't that what we often do in times of trouble? We go on trying to pursue relief on our own. We meet the first people in our story. Continuing in verse 1. And a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. The names of his two sons were Malan and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went to the country of Moab and remained there. Following the great setting in the story, we meet great characters in the story. I would encourage you as we study Ruth over the next four weeks, to during the week read through the story of Ruth. The great, the great uh, thing that you can do is pick out a character and follow their story through the, through the pages of Ruth. It's four chapters, they're very short chapters, but it's a great opportunity for you to learn more about these characters. We'll highlight a few along the way, but all of the characters change during the story, except for God. We meet Elimelech. Or Elimelech. His name means, my God is king. At the end of the book of Judges, there is a, a line that says, and then in those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Here is Elimelech, the king 
or by God as king. He is named after God being king over Israel. We mean his wife, Naomi. Her name means pleasant or my delight. We mean their two sons. If if you thought, what is going, what is going to happen when my God is king marries my life or pleasant? They're going to have kids like wonderful, right? Or amazing or stupendous. But we meet their two sons, Mahlon, whose name means sick. So look at the baby and go, hmm, sick. <laughs> it does have a little different meaning nowadays, but. And then Kilion means pining or wasting away. This might be a, a hint as to the time that they were born, maybe near the famine. But Elimelech takes his family to Moab. Moab, a country on the eastern side of the Jordan River. The descendants of Lot and one of his daughters related to the people of Israel, but oftentimes found themselves with hostility towards each other. Elimelech takes his family and goes to Moab. It's understandable to go and to try to look for food if there's no food in the land. They live in Bethlehem, which is the house of bread. There was no bread in the house, in the house of bread. So it makes sense that he would go and look for food in other lands. After all, God had moved people throughout history, the Israelite people, where he went. He took Abraham out of the land because of famine. The people, the tribes of Israel came down to Egypt because famine in the land which God had preordained Joseph to go and to preserve their lives. So maybe this was that time, that kind of movement. But it seems from the text that Elimelech was leaving for good. It says that he went to Moab and remained there, not a sojourn there. Elimelech was seeking to solve his own problems by a change of location. Maybe you've had this thought yourself. Well, I have this conflict or I've got this relationship issue. If I just moved away, things would be better. I'm having some financial issues. I'm having some struggles. If I just go to a different town, if I just get out of here, things will be better. The grass is always greener on the other side. But Elon was solving his own problems rather than trusting God. Whatever his motivation, there's nothing in the text that tells us that Elimelech was told by God to go to Moab. The time was remaining, oh, excuse me, the time of their remaining in Moab was hard on the family, especially Naomi. If you look in verses three to five, Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died. She was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives, the name of one was Orpah and the other Ruth. And they lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilion died. So that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Not only was Naomi left without her husband, certainly a moment of grief. She was left with her two sons who were just reaching marrying age. They would be her security in navigating life. They would be help for her. She wouldn't be able to stand or have standing in society. She would not be receiving an inheritance as a woman. She would be too old or consider herself too old to start over again. So she looked to her sons to provide for her and then her sons died. Naomi was left without any covering to help her. Losing those who are close to you hurts. Naomi's grief expresses itself throughout the rest of this chapter. She decides to return to Bethlehem from Moab. I'm going to go back to where I was from. She recognizes that her life is now hard, and she attributes that to God. In verse 11, she says to Ruth and Orpah, Know, my daughters, it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake. The hand of the Lord has gone out against me. She understands the impact, not just on her life, but on her daughter-in-laws. And then as she returns to Bethlehem at the end of the chapter, she says to those women there, we're saying, is, it, is this Naomi, is this pleasant? Is this 
My delight? She responds to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi, when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? Naomi recognizes that God is still in control, even in the midst of sorrow, of loss, and grief. She is wrestling with the bitterness of life. She understands that the situation that she is in is bitter, is Mara. She doesn't say that God is bitter towards her. And she doesn't also say that she is bitter towards God, although it carries through in her words. There's a bitterness to her life. And yet she still calls him the Almighty. She still calls him Lord. She recognizes that God is always in control. He has blessed her, had blessed her before she left home with a husband and two sons, and yet he's taken that blessing away. He's declared that this should be. He's testified against her, and he has brought hard times to her. Even though bitter times have come, she has not fully rejected God. Many of us have lost close ones, those who are near to us. It is a difficult road to walk. Pain and grief are right and should be expressed. For those of you who have lost those very near to you, you understand there's a numbness, there's a disorientation that comes along with trying to navigate the emotional and relational and social connections to try to navigate what is it like to try to think of others as you grieve yourself. Naomi found herself in this type of a situation. Decisions had to be made, even as she's grieving her husband and the loss of her sons. But we are not meant to walk this road alone. We are not to pursue relief on our own. Most importantly, God sees us. He knows our grief. He knows what you're going through. He cares for you. His sovereign hand, while allowing such loss to happen, is outstretched to you in comfort and love. He will always make, or he will make all things right and wipe every tear from our eyes. He wants to work in you to bring you through and to reestablish you on solid ground. He's given us also, not just himself, but each other, to walk through times of hard life. Naomi was given the gift of two daughter-in-laws. God works in and through his people to bring care and comfort, share in time of need. When we try to do things our own way, when we try to, to solve our own problems, God often brings things into our life to cause us to turn to him. Naomi was going through a bitter time at this point in the story, it would seem that the story, the whole book, is going to be about Naomi. She is the central focus so far. And it's often through difficult times that we know that God preserves us through hard times even when we don't see it. So Naomi has to make a decision. She offers to her daughter and in law two ways of return. After about 10 years, in Moab, Naomi decides to return to Bethlehem. Verse six says, she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard the fields of Moab, that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. God has restored house, or bread to the house of bread. She's hearing rumblings that things are good back home. The food is available, and the food is available because the Lord has provided it. God is at work again amongst his people, bringing blessing. As Naomi and Ruth return at the end of the chapter, they come at the beginning of the barley harvest. As we read through the next few chapters, it is a bountiful barley harvest. And so the conversation has to happen. I'm going back from Moab. I'm, I'm returning back to Bethlehem. Let's have this conversation. Of the 85 verses in the book of Ruth, 56 of them are conversations. There's a lot of dialogue. And in this dialogue in chapter 1, 12 times, we see return, return, go back, turn back. There's an emphasis here in this chapter. We're going to have a conversation about returning. 
Naomi's going to return to, to Bethlehem and she urges her daughters-in-law to go back to Moab, go back to their families. Her low expectations are driven, I think, mainly by just common sense realities. She can't replace the husbands that the girls have lost. She's too old to bear any more sons, and even if she could, even, in that, even on that day, the girls could not wait until they were old enough to be married. By then, the girls themselves would be too old to bear children. And even though they might hope to find other men to marry in Bethlehem, being foreigners, their prospects were few. The fact that they were widows and not virgins would count against them. And so their marriage prospects would be so much better if they went back to Moab. Naomi is thinking practically. They have too much to lose by sticking with Naomi. This is a, a difficult decision. With two options laid out before them, Ruth and Orpah must decide. There's obviously affection between these two women, or between these three women. They have gone through grief together. They have bonded and cared for each other. Naomi has been, been caring for, has been leading, has been, been building into her daughters-in-law. Her daughters-in-law has been supporting and encouraging her. So it's a difficult decision, and she lays before them two options. First is this, go home, go to Moab, restart life as it used to be. Go back to comfort. You go back, you'll have instant support. You're, you're part of that people. You'll have a family there. You know the customs. You know the gods that you used to worship. Or the second option, and that is to return with Naomi to Bethlehem, to Israel. Going with Naomi is not a comfortable decision. It is a hard decision. It's full of uncertainty. Will the daughters-in-law have any support at all? Or will they find themselves as foreigners being subject to hostility? What does it mean to go into a completely different country, different culture, different customs? Difficulties with that. Her only family, their only family would be Naomi. They would have a different God. A God that was worshipped in Israel that was not. One of the many gods of Moab. And so the daughters-in-law have to take, have to make a decision. Either go to their past world, what they're used to, or go with Naomi, the difficult road going to Naomi's past world. Naomi had warned them of the bitter life that they would face if they came along with. So Orpah decides that she is going to take the first option. She's going to go back home. Go back to comfort. Go back to her old way of life. Old gods. Old customs. The scripture tells us that Ruth clings to Naomi. Ruth's pledge gives us an insight what she saw in Naomi, she says in verse 15, she says, see, your sister in law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There I'll be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also of anything but death parts me from you. What made Ruth choose the harder route? Choose to follow Naomi. First, I think she is she loves Naomi. The thing that she says to say that she wants to be with her. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. I want to be with you. Where you die, I will die. I will remain there. Where you're buried, I will be buried. This is of great importance. You remember the story of, of Jacob asking Joseph, saying, take my bows, don't leave them in Egypt. I want to be buried back in my family's ancestral land. Ruth says, where, I, where you are buried, I will be buried. It will now be my people. Only death will part us. Her love for Naomi, she wanted to stay with her. I think she also heard about from Naomi about the people of God. Your people will be my people. I want to be part of 
your people as well, even if they weren't accepting of foreigners. And she took the harder path because she knew from spending time with Naomi, who Naomi's God was. Your God will be my God. Leaving behind the multiple gods of worship in, in Moab and turning away from where she had put her faith and her fear in the past, she said, I want your God to be my God. How do people, when they interact with you, know your God? Can they tell that you are different than the rest of the culture? Do you talk about him often, even when things are going hard, when things are bitter? How do people around you know that your God is worth giving their life for? Ruth was willing to lay it all down to start a new life, returning with Naomi. Friends, God offers each of us a new life in Christ and gives us this option these two options, the gospel gives us two options when we are presented with the fact that we cannot obtain a relationship with God on our own, not through our works, not through our church attendance, not through being generally nice people, that we, it is impossible for us to have a relationship with God, but that God sent Jesus to die on the cross to remove the barrier so that we might have a relationship with him we're then left with two options. Do we believe that? Or do we go back to what we used to be like? Do we go back to what is comfortable? Do we go back to our old friends, or our old patterns of life, our old sinful ways, trying to figure things out on our own and reject what God has laid out before us? Or do we take the path of dying daily, of losing our life so we can have life in him? Two options, two ways to return. I either return to my old path or I return through Christ, the creator and the lover of my soul. Well, as the story, chapter one finishes up, Naomi goes home. But she has a difficult homecoming. It's not always easy to come home, especially in times where things get hard. Naomi and Ruth continued their journey until they finally come to Bethlehem. When they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred up against the, stirred up because of them. And the, and the women said, is this Naomi? And she said, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Lord has dealt very bitterly with me. It's hard to come back when things have been difficult. Perhaps it's hard to come back to your place when you've lost a loved one you need to take care of and an estate, and you come to town and you see some of the old places where you grew up, places where you're at. Maybe you have gone through a divorce and you go back home and it's difficult. Maybe something else has happened in your life that has brought shame and yet you go home and it seems like those especially even who should love you and accept you hold you at a distance. Passage goes on, verse 21, and I, I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? The women in the town recognize her physically, but they notice that something is off. While they're greeting her question, Naomi relays her perspective on life. Don't call me pleasant, don't call me my delight anymore. My life is bitter now. It is not pleasant. It is not a delight. Don't remind me of the past when I was here before. But Naomi also explains her perspective on her view of life. That God has brought calamity, bitterness on her. She had a good life, but now she is empty. The what ifs. The if only. What, what if? What if we had come back instead of remaining in Moab? Would things have been different? Would my sons be alive? Would my husband be alive? If only we had stayed in Bethlehem instead of going to a foreign land. It's hard to come home sometimes. We reach the end of this chapter. Naomi is back home to what's familiar. Ruth, however, 
is off to the side in the background. She's called Ruth the Moabite, and this is going to be her identity throughout the rest of the book. She's an outsider. She's from the other side of the blessing of God. She's from far away. She's not yet seen as any kind of a welcome addition. She's relatively unknown and in the background. We were to stop at the end of chapter one, we would think that this, again, is Naomi's story. Ruth is obscure in the background. Naomi is the focal point. But God has been at work in Ruth's life as well. We don't, we shouldn't forget that Ruth also lost her husband. She thought that she had found her love, her covering, the man who was going to protect her, defend her, provide for her, and now he was dead. She's given her mother-in-law as a gift to care for and to learn from. And God has brought her to his people. He has brought her to himself. Ruth's story is still a story of perseverance and preservation. Ruth has chosen the hard path, but God has preserved her through this. So if we look at the beginning of this great love story, we see that life can be hard for us and for those around us. God often uses circumstances to draw us to him. C.S. Lewis said, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. God sometimes brings us through difficult times like Naomi had in order to rouse us from our deafness, rouse us from our complacency, but to bring us towards him. God offers two, pa two paths back of return to us. We can either go back to relying on ourselves on what used to be in comfort, or we can follow him into the great adventure of coming back to him from our life of sin and death to a place of life. God shows us his love in the great love story. The great love story that he loved us first and he sent his son to die, to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So the question I will ask you today is which path are you on? Which return have you made? Have you chosen the difficult path of following after God or are you going back to your old ways? going back to what's comfortable. And I'll ask you as well, those people around you, the ones who know you best, how do they know who your God is? Do they know that your God is great? Do they know that your God is loving, that your God provides, that your God is sufficient for all of life? Do they know that by your life? Would they be willing to lay down their lives because of what they see in your life? Let's pray. Father, we ask you that you would help us this morning to be able to see this great love story over the next several weeks. But Father, we thank you for the hard beginning. We thank you that there was an obstacle in the way of this love story. We thank you that you have shown us through your word that sometimes when we rely on ourselves, when we are self-sufficient, that we need correction, and that you are kind to bring that to us. I ask, Father, that as we study this story, we would see not just Ruth, Naomi, Boaz, but rather we would see Christ, our Redeemer, the one who bought us, the one who overcame the impossible, to draw us to himself, to call us his bride. That we would live in such a way that the great news that we would celebrate of an engagement or a wedding, the joy that comes with it would be the same type of joy that we live in and walk in and speak of every day. The great joy that you have set your affections on us and that you have redeemed us to yourself. In the name of Jesus.